Good afternoon. I am Philip Griffiths, a professor in the School of Mathematics and former director of the Institute. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the Institute this afternoon to hear Jean Bourgain, a professor in the School of Mathematics, who will speak on the search for randomness. Following his lecture, there will be time for some questions and answers. And after that, you are all invited to a wine and cheese reception over in the Fold Hall Common Room. The need for pseudo-randomness in various parts of modern science, ranging from numerical simulations to cryptography, has challenged our limited understanding of this issue and our mathematical resources. In his talk, Professor Bourgain will explore some of the problems of pseudo-randomness along with some of the tools that uh, are available to address these problems. His work touches on several topics that are central to contemporary mathematical analysis. In addition, it has had important consequences in fields as removed from the topic itself as theoretical computer science and analytic number theory. In 1994, Professor Bourgain was awarded the Fields Medal. In addition, he is the recipient of numerous other prizes and as a foreign member of a number of academies, including the French Academy, the Royal Sw Swedish Academy, and the Polish Academy. He received his PhD in 1977 and his habilitation habilita in 1979 from the Free University of Brussels. He has held positions in the Free University of Brussels and at IHES in France before joining the faculty here in 1994. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Jean Bourgain. Okay. So I'd like to thank you for this introduction, Philip. So let, it, let me uh, first tell you that this is not going to be a philosophical talk. This is rather, this is supposed to be a more mathematical talk. So I want to explain uh, something about the title. Uh, what this title uh, is about is the uh, problem of uh, generating explicitly and say within our computational means uh, models and processes that look like uh, true uh, random models. What do I mean by a true random model? It would be an ideal coin flipping, for instance. So, um, such uh, this problem is obviously important of significance in many applications of various types. You just uh, think what, going, what, what is going on uh, in a gambling, in, in a slot machine, or in a video game. And well, there are many other issues. And it's also a problem that has generated, in particular at the Institute, a certain amount of uh, quite uh, interesting mathematics also recently. And so what I want to do is to incorporate some comments about this mathematics uh, through this uh, talk. So um, search for randomness. Of course, a process uh, which you really generate the way I'm describing, which should be an easy generation, uh, is going to be far from a truly random process. And you can only uh, hope that there will be some common features with true randomness. So more practically, you have the, the question of de-randomization, which is roughly the following question. Suppose you have a job which you know can be done by a, a true random process. So you know that uh, if you had access to an ideal coin flipping, you would be able to, to take care of the matter. And this matter can be, can be various things, quite different one from the other. So then the, the question uh, you are facing is how to come up with something which is really uh, practical some process which is practical and more or less accomplishes the same task. So I will discuss uh, two examples of that. The first example is that of generating uh, random numbers, random integers. 
the second example is the generation of random graphs. And both of these uh, questions are questions of great uh, practical importance and also led to quite a bit of, I think, interesting mathematics. So to recapitulate, on one hand, we have true randomness, which is generated by a truly random process, like ideal coin flipping. On the other hand, there is pseudo-randomness, which is the behavior of deterministic processes. It has various appearances. There are physical appearances. Uh, one noticeable uh, one uh, uh, issue where uh, this randomness uh, is put forward is in the Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis, which is the fact that a mechanical system goes through all states compatible with, it tot with its uh, total energy. It's something I will not discuss here. This is what you may call the, the physical version of pseudo-randomness. What I will discuss here is, uh, on the other hand, the, the other way to uh, come to pseudo-randomness, which are arithmetical means. Now, in fact, at the second thought, if you um, uh, I would guess most of the pseudo-randomness you encounter in, in real life, for instance, just think uh, what you see when you walk through an, uh, a casino room. They will be either of this physical kind or they will be of the, of the arithmetical kind. Now, this talk is only dealing with arithmetical uh, simulation of uh, uh, randomness and this is already quite vast topic as, uh, as you will see. Generating random numbers, well, besides video games, there are other, many other issues where that is important. There is the issue of computer simulations, Monte Carlo methods, numerical integration, cryptography, and so on. And actually, going back to the history, an early example of such an arithmetical process of generating uh, random uh, integers was uh, put forward by von Neumann, although eventually he was rather negative about it, and rightfully so, and I don't think there was ever any kind of rigorous mathematical study made out of it, which is the middle square method, but say historically I should mention it. We will see something later that looks very much the same, but which is quite different in fact. So how does the middle square, how does the middle square method uh, works, well, you, you start with a four-digit number, which is 111. One, one. You take a square and you make it an eight-digit number. So the square would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1, uh, if I calculate it correctly. So you want to make it an eight-digit number, so you add a zero in front. Then you take the middle digits, 2, 3, 4, 3, and you repeat. You keep going. Now, it's not really clear what it does. Uh, experimentally, a posteriori, um, it was found out that as a random, pseudo-random number generator, it does rather poorly because periods tend to be relatively short, which means that rather quickly you come back to the same numbers. And this is, in fact, the main enemy when, when you try to generate uh, pseudo-random numbers. This is the, the problem of having short periods. In fact, uh, in the same paper, which was a, a paper later in, in his uh, life, Von Neumann was rather negative about it, and he made it clear, and rightfully so, that using arithmetical methods to produce random digits is absurd. Uh, on the other hand, there is a famous paper by Blum Blum Schupp, I will say a few things about, uh, where they take a more positive stand, and, well, the first statement is, is more or less tautological, but then we have to make it more precise. So what they say is that ideally we would like a pseudo-random sequence uh, generator to quickly produce from short seats long sequences of bits that appear in any way to be generated by the consecutive flips of a flat coin. Now, of course, that is what you would like, but you have to be more specific. And uh, they were more specific by requiring that obviously the standard statistical tests should be satisfied. So if you check on a long sequence the occurrence of frequencies, uh, the occurrence frequency of the zero and the ones, they should be a half. And also when you take consecutive integers, you should have the right mixing properties. That is what they call standard statistical tests. And there is 
quite an extensive theory now how to justify this kind of things uh, in the context of uh, sequences which are arithmetically produced. We're going to say something more about that. Then there is another in, uh, issue which is that of unpredictability. Of course, already the fact that you have good mixing is some weak form of unpredictability, but we want to go beyond that. And the statement would be that if I give you a finite segment in the sequence, it is not easy to say what is going to be the previous or the next digit. Guessing whether uh, the next element is going to be a zero or a one cannot be done better than by a random guess. As far as unpredictability concerns, uh, as we will see, there are in fact very few unconditional results and this is something for which we are much less well equipped to start really proving theorems about, unless these theorems are really conditional. Well, they discussed, Bloom Bloom Schub discussed two examples. Uh, the second example is kind of reminiscent of von Neumann's and it is called the x square mod n generator. So the x square mod n generator is one of the early examples of a pseudo-random number generator. So the way it goes is that you start from an integer, which is a product of two primes about the same size, p and q, and you assume that p and q are equal to 3 mod 4. This, so when, when you divide by 4, uh, the remainder is going to be 3. This is about as much mathematical as this talk is going to become. So when you have that, uh, what you do then is look at the quadratic residues mod n. So these are the integers, say, from uh, 0 up to n minus 1, which are a square up to a multiple of n. And take this set of quadratic residues. Uh, because of our assumption, every element x has a unique square root in x. Now, let me uh, stress the fact that, and this is quite important, it's that uh, you know the integer n, but you don't know the factorization of the integer. Uh, we will come back to, on that. So what is happening, eventually what you want to output is the sequence of zero ones. So how does it work? Well, uh, so your, your mapping goes from the quadratic residues to itself. You start from x0, say some uh, integer between, uh, between zero uh, and um, n minus 1, you take its square, you get another integer, you reduce it mod n, so you look at the remainder after division by n, you get x1, which is again between whatever 0 and minus 1, take x1 square, reduce it mod n, get x2, etc. So the sequence x0, x1, x2, xi plus 1, and so on, are integers between 0 and uh, n minus 1. In fact, they are quadratic residues. And to get a bit sequence, what you do is that you just take their parity. So if that is not sufficiently clear, let us go through an example. We take p equals 7, q equals 19, so the product n is 133. You start from x0, which is 4, which is an even thing, so we get 0. The next one, the square x1 is 16, so again b1 is equal to 0. 16 square is... Uh, how much is 16 square? Uh, 256. So you reduce it by 133. You get a remainder, which is 123. So B2 is equal to 1. Take the square of 123, reduce mod 133. You get 100, so B3 is 0. Then you get 25, which gives you 1. Uh, 93 gives you 1. And then after six iterations, you are back to the number 4, which gives you 0. So this is the outputted sequence and its periodicity is 6. So that is how these things work. And so to address the first uh, question, um, what is the statistics? Now, how do you express that you have a good statistics of 0 and 1s? That you have a good mixing of uh, 0 and 1s? Well, the crucial concept is the mathematical concept of discrepancy. So how does it work? Well, you start from a string omega of 0 and 1, so of length r. r is some fixed number, so you have omega 1, omega 2, omega r. Say here you have r equals 3, so omega 1 is 0, omega 2 is 1, omega 3 is 1. So you're taking a fixed word of zeros and 1s, and you look at the occurrence frequency of omega in a long segment of your sequence. So 
clearly, if you had a perfectly random sequence, this occurrence frequency would be 2 minus r because every word omega is supposed to occur with the same frequency. So ideally, the occurrence frequency would be 2 minus r. And what we are expressing with discrepancy is just the difference between the true occurrence frequency and the ideal occurrence frequency. Now, any theory of pseudo-randomness somewhere has its roots in mathematics in the sense that in order to, to do something, we are relying on mathematical theories and often non-trivial mathematical theories. So the interest of modular arithmetic is that there are such theories available. And uh, the theory which expresses these good distributional properties is the theory of exponential sums, which was developed in particular through the work of André Vey, quite famous works of uh, Vey, and which applies particularly well to uh, getting the statistical, the confirmation of these good uh, statistical properties of arithmetical sequences, for instance, of the type I just described. The only trouble of the, of the, the results that are used there is that they require very long periods. For instance, to get results uh, about the x squared pseudo-random number generator, one needs periods which are as large as, in fact, which are large compared with n at the power three quarters, which is a problem because there we are entering uh, the realm of unproven assumptions that, in fact, say for those who are mathematicians, have to do with the multiplicative order of two mod prime, and proving that this happens infinitely, uh, infinitely often is something we can't do at this point, uh, and it is related to a mathematical problem known as the Artin conjecture. Blum Blum Schupp got around it in another way, also in a conditional way, by relying on uh, primes which are Sophie Germain primes. Uh, these are primes of the form 2p plus 1, where p is a prime itself. So in other words, the integer n we are starting from is a product of two Sophie Germain primes. And if you have that kind of primes, it's very easy to see that this period is going to be long. So what to do about that? Well, uh, if you want unconditional results, there is still a way, and this came with recent developments in combinatorial number theory, which allowed to handle such very short periods. So compared with the uh, classical techniques, say methods a la way, way, what you are getting is a less precise information but which is more broadly applicable. And in particular, with these techniques, you can prove results about distribution and joint, good joint distribution of the x squared pseudo-random number generator without having to rely, say, on Artin's conjecture. I will come back to on these methods a uh, little later. Now, I have to say uh, a few things about unpredictability issues, as this was really the, the main emphasis in the, the Bloom Bloom uh, Schub paper. Uh, so imp uh, unpredictability issue, like I said, there are few unconditional results. What uh, Bloom Bloom Schub put forward is an assumption of uh, what they call quadratic residuosity assumption. So what is quadratic residuosity assumption? Well, remember, I put forward a set X of quadratic residues. Now, the quadratic residuosity assumption is just the fact that if I give you an integer x, deciding whether x is a square mod n is hard. It can't be done in an easy way. This is an assumption. Note that it's very important, again, that n is a product of two primes and that we don't know the factorization of n, otherwise it would be easy. So what they uh, show is that if you assume this quadratic residuosity assumption, uh, then x squared pseudo-random number generator is, for instance, unpredictable to the left. What does it mean? Well, assume that you had a better than a random guess what is going in this typical sequence, what is going to be uh, the previous digit if you know a certain segment. Well, if you had a strategy to do that, then you would automatically have a strategy to decide 
whether an integer is a quadratic uh, residue mod n or not, uh, at least with a very high probability. So therefore, since you assume there is no easy way uh, to decide with high probability whether uh, your integer is going to be a quadratic residue or not, uh, automatically you conclude from that, but this is of course a conditional statement, uh, that uh, predicting the next digit to the left is hard. And a stronger result, a stronger claim was uh, obtained by Yo that assuming quadratic residuality assumption, the sequences produced by x squared mod n pass every probabilistic polynomial statistical test. And I will not explain you what it is because it's not going to be very helpful. And it basically tells you what you feel it, it should tell you. Um, now, what we have seen there is one example where we use algebraic complexity as a true substitute, as a substitute, sorry for true randomness. So in other words, we have produced uh, sequences in a simple way, in fact, by simple arithmetics, because it's very easy to generate uh, the, the bloom bloom shoop sequence that has a certain number of random properties, even provable, some conditional. And uh, it turns out that uh, there has been particular advances in this area of using algebraic complete, uh, complexity uh, to generate so-called randomness uh, because of recent developments in combinatorics of finite fields. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have heard about that earlier. Uh, because of some understanding which is called the same product phenomenon, uh, so, to repeat the way uh, my colleague uh, Avi Vigdorzan is putting it, what is the same product phenomenon? Well, if you go back to, uh, to uh, how, how do they call it, uh, uh, early grades uh, school, what you learn is the addition table and you also uh, learn about a little later then about the multiplication table. So if you do that for the numbers from 1 up to uh, 99 or 100, and you're looking at the addition table, and you compare with the multiplication table, you will see that there are many more numbers that come up in the multiplication table. So this, of course, is something which is well known. But what turns out is that what you have there is actually only a manifestation of something which is much more general. And somehow it was only realized like six years ago or so. And uh, in all the whatever uh, recent developments I'm referring to, this principle plays quite an important role or say variance of this principle and also in many things I will not talk about here. Another example where this principle plays a crucial role is the derandomization of random graphs. So the property, of course, you always have to be specific. So the property which is now at stakes is expander property. So we are looking for graphs which are sparse. I will explain you what means sparse and have a high connectivity, which is going to be expressed through certain expansion properties, uh, as I will uh, make more precise in a moment. So this is, again, a um, problem of derandomization that was solved by uh, algebraic techniques. There are many applications. Uh, this is a problem that is of interest for many reasons. Uh, it gives you efficient communication networks, for instance, the, the way the, the brain works, or at least this uh, should work. Uh, error correcting codes problems of de-randomization of random algorithms, problems of quantum computation, uh, group theory, geometry, uh, etc. And what the, the rest of this talk is going to be about some of these applications and they will probably not get to the end, but say when, when the time is over, we, uh, we just uh, stop, we see how far we can get. So uh, the first, the first uh, concept is uh, sparse. So a way to get the sparse graph is by looking at k regular graphs. k is a fixed number, say 3 for instance. The graph is on a large number of vertices and k regular just means that every vertex has k neighbors. So what you have here is a model of a graph on 80 vertices 
if one counts them. And it is three regular because every vertex is connected to, uh, has three neighbors, is connected to three other vertices, as one sees. The other concept is high connectivity. What means high connectivity? It means that if you start doing a random walk on the graph, although this graph is very sparse, very quickly you can end up anywhere. So you want to say that very quickly you fill the whole set of vertices. So the key concept there is that of expansion ratio. So since this concept is going to be essential for the rest of the talk, let me just take a moment to explain it. So what we have is a graph, and this graph is, um, uh, this graph is on six uh, vertices, for instance. Uh, if we have a subset of this graph, so we are looking, for instance, at the upper three vertices, what we call the boundary of the set S is just a collection of all the edges that go from the set S to its complement. So for instance, if you look at the, the set of the three top vertices, what is the boundary? Well, you have these two guys, which go from the set to its complement. Then there are these two, and there are these two. So the size of the boundary is six, and this ratio for that particular set is two. Now, what means that you have, so what is the, the expansion ratio? It is the minimal ratio between the boundary of a set and the size of a set, uh, where we restrict, of course, to sets which are not too large. Expansion means that this ratio remains bounded from below. So, roughly speaking, in Lehman's words, what it means is that uh, every set has a large boundary. Unless, of course, the set is basically everything. And if every set has a large boundary, then obviously, if you're going to walk around the graph very quickly, you're going to fill the whole graph. So, the question about existence of such graphs, so there are two uh, properties there which a priori may be somewhere contradictory. On one hand, we want a graph which is sparse. On the other hand, we want to have this expansion property. Well, this problem was uh, solved, at least in the random world, by Pinsker in 73, who proved that if you take a typical k regular graph where k is a fixed integer at least equal to 3, so look at the typical 3 regular graph. A typical means a random three regular graph, which is clear what it means, on n vertices. Well, this is an expander graph, and well, this is an ambiguous statement, of course. What it means is that when n grows, this expansion ratio doesn't go to zero. This is what you call an expanding family. So here we have, obviously, a problem which is about de-randomization, which is the question, how do you come up with examples which are really constructive? because randomness doesn't belong to, uh, to the practical world. So how do we come up with such uh, concrete expander graphs? Well, again, algebraic methods did it. In particular, there is the work of Margulis, who produced also in 73 uh, explicit expander graphs by looking at Cayley graphs of groups. Now, Cayley graphs on groups are very simple graphs. Uh, they are completely explicit. The way it works like that, I will give you several examples, is that you start from a group. These are the vertices. Then you take a set S of generators of the group, a set of small size, say K. Uh, one likes to take this set symmetric. And then you get a graph, which is called the Cayley graph, uh, corresponding to the pair G being the group, S being the, the generators. Uh, where the vertices are just the elements of G, and then you get the edges simply by connecting an element of G with the elements you get by multiplying with one of the elements of the generating, of the, of the generating set. Why do you want this set to be generating? Well, you like to have this graph connected. The minimal condition to have uh, a graph which is an expander graph, of course, is to have a graph which is connected. So that's why you assume that they are generators. So let me give you an example which is uh, also of very... Um, uh, elementary nature, unfortunately, does not produce you expander graphs. So here we are taking the group G. So the group G are just the integers with the addition, and then you reduce mod 10. So the elements of this group are 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., up to 9, and then when you keep going, you get, you get 10, but 10 is 0 if you, reduce, if you reduce mod 10. So 1 is definitely a generator. Since you want to make the set symmetric, you take 1 minus 1. 
And so you connect uh, every element of your group with the previous one and the next one. If you are at, uh, at 9, well, x minus 1 gives you 8, x plus 1 is 10, but this is 0 because that's a reduction of 10. So that is one simple example of a Cayley graph. Uh, as you will undoubtedly realize, this Cayley graph and the extensions when you go, when you replace 10 by 10,000 or so, are never going to be good expanders because if you take a large set, so you take 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, you only get a boundary which is of size 2. And no matter how, how large uh, an integer you take instead of 10, you're going to keep that, that phenomenon. So you, you will not get good expanders, and there is a reason for that. If you want to have good expansion, uh, like the way Margulis did, uh, for instance, what is needed are very non-commutative groups. And typical examples are provided by matrix groups. So when I told you before, this is as mathematical as it's going to come. I cheated a little bit. This is probably the most mathematical uh, slide here. So we are, we are looking at uh, groups which are SL2P. So SL2P are just uh, two by two matrices, A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D are residues mod P, so they, they range from zero to P minus one. And the condition is that the determinant should be equal to one after reduction mod P. So it should be one plus a multiple of P. So an example, uh, take p equals uh, 5, uh, then I would have the group SL25. Now, in general, SL2p has um, uh, p, p minus 1, p plus 1 elements. But what we are doing here is uh, the following. This is a small twist. We are taking the projective version. So we only have 60 elements. What means the projective, the, the, the projective version? Well, it just means that we are factoring out minus the identity. So for instance, if you look at the matrix B, uh, B is not B uh, inverse, but it is B inverse up to uh, minus the identity. So the set I'm, I'm writing there, A, A minus 1, B, is indeed a symmetric set in the group PSL25, which have 60 elements, and uh, well, what you get is a graph here, which is three regular. And when P goes up, you get uh, nice expansion properties, which is a quite non-trivial thing. And uh, perhaps instead of trying to draw the pictures of this kind, it is better to look at an, uh, an, a description. This is not exactly the same thing, but it's very closely related. And the, rela the relation is gotten by uh, linear fraction maps mod P. If you don't know what it is, just ignore it. Uh, let me just tell you that instead of taking SL2P, we are going to get back to the old set, which are the residues mod P. Now, uh, this is exactly the, um, the example which I was describing there, where you would look at the Cayley graph of Z mod PZ, but then we are going to add one additional edge. We are going to connect not only x to x plus minus 1, but we are also going to connect it to 1 over x. So the rules still remain very simple. We are just adding one more edge, is connecting x to 1 over x. But the structures you are going to get are much, much more complex and kind of illustrate uh, that these graphs have a much higher level of connectivity. What you are seeing here are pictures uh, for p equals 101, 499, 997, and so on. And as you can see, uh, these things are infinitely more complex than the, uh, what, I, what I was telling, what I was showing you here. So what is the mathematical theory which is underlying that? Well, uh, part of this theory was provided by Selberg, who, uh, from whose work followed expansion at least for a large class of generators, but still for special generators. To illustrate this more concretely, uh, there is the following problem, which, was, which is really showing what was the, the type of situation one had, uh, which is called the one, two, three problem. So what you see here are uh, three sets of generators of SL2P. The first set is the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. You have to take the symmetric copies. I didn't symmetrize it. Uh, the second one, you replace the ones by a 2. And the third type is that you just replace uh, the, the 2 
here and there by a tree. So these systems of generators, they look, I mean, these sets of matrices, they look quite analogous. Uh, they are all uh, generators uh, of SL2P, but strangely enough, the S1, S2 turn out to lead to expander graphs as followed from Selberg's theory, while for S3, this problem was only solved quite recently, again, through methods from arithmetic combinatorics, because somehow the S3 did not fall under the purview of whatever Selberg uh, was proving. So the recent advance is that one has now a robust theory of expander Cayley graphs, in particular for groups S SL2N, which again came from this progress in arithmetic combinatorics I was referring to before. Uh, one particular manifestation of these results would be that if you look at such a Cayley graph, basically to have a good expander, it suffices that you don't have short loops. So you don't want to have loops which are small compared with the logarithm of n. In particular, this implies that most choices of generators give you good expansion. And so what you have is some kind of robust theory. Why is this interesting? Well, of course, it produces large classes of expander graphs, but it has another interest because it explains certain phenomena beyond randomness that one couldn't explain before. And, well, two examples of these phenomena, one has to do with quantum computation, and the other one has to do with quasi-crystals. So I was having these two topics depending on the amount of time that remained, but I think I have enough time to talk about, to say a little bit about both of these topics. So quantum computation, uh, in quantum computation, what you want to do are operations on uh, qubit states. So these qubit states are superpositions of two uh, uh, basic uh, states, which are zero and one, with coefficients alpha and beta, which are subject to the rule which is written here. So alpha, beta are complex numbers, the sum of the squares of their moduli adding up uh, to one. So the operations on these qubit states are performed by uh, unitary matrices. For, uh, for instance, if, if you look at uh, uh, Shor's uh, algorithm to uh, calculate a fast Fourier transform or so on. Uh, in order to avoid faults, what you uh, like to have are gates for which there are fault tolerant constructions. So the problem you run into is uh, the following. Assume you have an alphabet A of base gates which are special gates for which there are fault tolerant uh, constructions available, then if I give you a general gate, which means a, a general uh, matrix, unitary matrix, you like to approximate it well by a word, uh, by a product of elements of A and their inverses. So from where the following uh, natural definition, what is a computational uh, set uh, a uh, computation universal set of gates, well, it is, a fixed, it is a fixed finite set A of base gates, such that if I give you an arbitrary gate, it can be approximated arbitrarily well with a product of elements of A and their inverses. Now, the concept wouldn't be interesting unless you kind of can give an, um, a promising answer to the question, how good can an arbitrary gate be approximated by a short word in A? So this problem is solved to some extent by a process which is relatively simple, but still uh, has quite a bit of content, really uses the structure of, of the group, uh, of the, the, the special unitary group, which is the solovic algorithm. So the solovic algorithm tells you that whenever you take such a finite set A, which is computationally universal, then A is going to fill the special unitary group very quickly. And there are several versions of the solovic algorithm. One of these versions performs as follows. Uh, you have, if I give you any epsilon, no matter how small, you can produce a sequence inside your alphabet A of base gates, which is going to give you an approximation. So how does it work? You start from some gate, some element of SU2. 
for any epsilon, you can find a sequence uh, in your alphabet which is going to have log uh, 1 over epsilon to the power 3.97, say, uh, be of that length and is going to give you an approximation up to epsilon. And there is an extra bonus to it, which is also quite useful, is that the sequence you're, you're getting there, it doesn't only exist, but it can be generated uh, in a relatively easy way with an algorithm that has this running time. Of course, the problem that people were putting forward is whether one can do better. So if you want to approximate up to epsilon, since SU2 is something three-dimensional, you need to generate epsilon minus three elements. And you cannot do that unless your sequences are at least of length log one over epsilon in general. Because sequences of length shorter than, than that are not going to produce enough elements to approximate everything up to epsilon. From where uh, another uh, classical notion, which is that of an efficiently universal alphabet, well, an efficiently universal alphabet is an alphabet so that any gate, any SU2 gate, can be approximated within epsilon precision by a string of order log 1 over epsilon. Well, what I told you is that we're going beyond randomness. The truth is that we don't know whether a random choice of elements for A would do this job. On the other hand, there is a rather famous example, which is due to Lubotsky, Phillips, and Peter Sarnak, which was in fact quoted several times in the literature on, quasi, on uh, uh, quantum computation, uh, where they produce, based on a rather non-trivial theory of the type I described before, an explicit system, V1, V2, V3, which would give you such an efficiently, uh, such an, a system of uh, efficiently universal gates. One recent progress, uh, to put it uh, a little bit in a uh, simplified form, is that what is shown is that actually as soon as you have an, uh, a system which is computationally universal, this, this system is already efficiently universal. But there is a catch. You see, the thing is that with solovic Taif, you have, a poly, uh, you have an, an algorithm which is a simple algorithm to produce these approximating sequences. But they are a bit too long. They are a power of the log one over epsilon. The main open problem there is to find the polynomial time algorithm that generates an approximation with a word which is of length only of logarithmic size. So only we know that there are such short words which do the job, we don't know how to produce them efficiently. Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to discuss, say a few things about, is how these developments around uh, expanders explains certain things around uh, the, in the theory of aperiodic tilings, which is of relevance in modeling uh, quasi-crystals. So we should go back first to work of Penrose, uh, here you have an example of a so-called Penrose kite and dart tiling. This is a tiling of the two-dimensional plane, which uses two figures. Uh, one figure uh, is uh, a kite, so the, 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 the purple thing here, uh, the, the dark thing here is going to be uh, a, an, uh, a dart and then that guy, the other kind, are kites. So there are two types of uh, tiles, and all the tiles are uh, congruent copies of these two types. Uh, the tiling is uh, aperiodic. It is a typical, uh, what they call, uh, tiling obtained by, a substitu by a substitutional dynamics. But the rate of mixing, the, the degree of aperiodicity, is not very high. What I mean by that is that if you take a large box here of size n, well, the number of distinct orientations you're going to get in a box of size n is going to be small. It's going to be only logarithmic in n. And for some reason in the plane, you cannot hope to do better. So what we like to have are tilings which are much more chaotic. So we like, say, to make sure that in a volume of size n, you will have a number of tiles which grows much faster in the volume, say, power-like, and not the logarithmic, uh, logarithmic rate. 
So such a uh, potential tiling was put forward by John Conway and Charles Radin, and is called the quaquaversal tiling of three-dimensional space. It turns out that for this tiling, the number of tiles grows, so the tiles there are all congruent images of the same shape, which I will describe you in a moment. And the, the, the rate of the orientations grows as a power of the volume, and so also does the mixing rate. So this is a rather dark and confusing picture, but what happens is easy to explain. So what is the construction process? Uh, there is a little bit of theory of algebraic groups, which is in fact underlying this uh, construction, but they will not get in, into that. Uh, anyway, it does not explain the, uh, the, the features we want to explain. So you start uh, with a prism which has dimensions 1, 1, square root and 3, 2. The square root of 3 is quite important there. So this has very special measurements. And what you do is that you subdivide this prism in eight daughter prisms, which are homothetic images with a factor a half, and then you rescale the whole thing by multiplying by two, and you keep going. So uh, it's probably not completely clear how you do this subdivision, but you will see at least clearly what are the two, what are the two front tiles here. So we have to generate six more by splitting up the back. So you have the right back and the left back. So for the right back, uh, what you have are three tiles, which are these two and one on top. Now note that the left side is splitted in a different way because you get a lower one and then the top is splitted that way. So for at each operation, you're going to replace a tile by eight tiles that have different orientations, of course, which are uh, uh, homothetic images with factor a half. And then you rescale the whole thing just by uh, so you have these eight tiles. You want to bring, you want to bring them back uh, to the unit size by multiplying with two, and you keep going. So after, uh, after uh, n steps, what you have generated is eight at the power n tiles, which will create, I mean, which will fill up, uh, take an amount of space, which is of course going to be uh, exponential in n. And so um, the point is that uh, what uh, Conway and Radin uh, were hoping is that these orientations, in fact, also should grow uh, exponentially in N and have a rate of mixing which is exponential in N. So uh, there is a paper by Conway and Radin in Inventiones where they do an uh, algebraic study of what is really governing the styling and also obtain certain results. Uh, in particular, they show that this quaquaversal tiling is going to be in the limit statistically invariant under all rotations without addressing the problem whether the rate of uh, mixing is in fact going to be exponentially fast. Now, extensive numerics were done, in particular by uh, Draco, Sadon, and Van Weerden where they checked what was the rate of mixing of uh, these orientations. Just uh, the, the, the way one does mathematically is by looking at the at representations on spaces of spherical harmonics. And you probably don't know what this means. But the only point I like to make here is that uh, what you see on the right are certain eigenvalues in fact, a record eigenvalues, and what matters to have a good rate of mixing is that the difference between the number, the difference between one and the number you have there is quite large. Uh, so, as you can see already at uh, 258, you have a gap, what they call a spectral gap, which is at most a few thousands. So based on these numerics, and this is only going up to 258, it seems like it is a quite uh, bold conjecture to believe that actually there is uh, a true spectral gap, which means 
which is another way of expressing that in the limit, the rate of mixing is really exponential in n. But it turned out to be correct, and it, it was never clear to me how people based on such numerics can make this kind of conjectures, but uh, amazingly, a few years uh, ago, the conjecture was proven to be correct, again, using uh, techniques from uh, arithmetic combinatorics, and of course, these arguments are quite complicated, and they provide a rate of mixing which is hardly explicit. But for once, uh, say, poor results mathematically, which are non-trivial, but of a poor quantitative uh, value, they are just confirmed because the, the true experimental values are also very poor. So, I mean, it would have been a contradiction if we eventually would have proven, some, if something would have been proven that, uh, that is in violation with these very poor numerics. So the, the moral of the story is that the quackoversal tiling has an exponential mixing rate, but this mixing rate is uh, very uh, slow. By the way, the, the, the question whether this is the right rate which was confirmed by the numerics, it's still open. The only thing which is known now is that there is a certain rate. So there is some number here which is strictly less than one, but it is very close to one. We don't know what it is. So as I think I have convinced you uh, that pseudo-randomness has many faces. Uh, there are many faces that were not uh, discussed uh, here, and that's the good thing. Actually, you can give many lectures about it, uh, which are relatively uh, disjoint from each other. What I have done here only is to describe a few aspects of pseudo-randomness that has to do with arithmetics and say some recent advances in arithmetics. And uh, no matter what is the, the type of mathematics you are, you are using uh, to uh, understand this pseudo-randomness, uh, typically the, the theories which are behind are, are quite enriching. And so I would say that, for instance, the uh, uh, the problem about uh, the, the problem around the, the, de the derandomization of the theorem of Pinsker I mentioned to you uh, earlier has been a source of inspiration for, for mathematicians uh, until now, and it has many other aspects which I, I haven't touched touched upon here. So this is the end of the talk. Uh, I have to thank two people. Uh, the first is Alex Gambert, who made my job very easy because basically half of the material which was presented here was provided by him. And the other person is Eli Gustafsson, which also helped me a lot in preparing the talk. Thank you. I'd like to thank John for a very interesting talk. And uh, the floor is open for uh, questions or comments. sequences by some sort of physical processes. Right, uh, right. Could you say a bit more about that? Um, well, the, the typical mathematical theory, which is again an unproven theory, as some of you may know, uh, of justifying um, uh, randomness, say, uh, through um, uh, something like a Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis, uh, definitely is, is something which is extremely deep and, an, uh, and a topic uh, of, of research for, for mathematicians. Uh, the, eventually, the way this thing uh, is going to be justified or not is another matter. Now, the question which was asked, uh, well, it, it, I was mentioning uh, the, the fact that when you look in, in real life, say you walk in a casino, uh, the examples you will encounter, whether it's slot machines or other devices, are either arithmetic or physical. Say, for instance, one, uh, I was trying to find an, uh, this on the internet, so I don't exactly know the name of the game, uh, but you, you want to illustrate something that would look like a Boltzmann hypothesis application, which is this game where you have a device which shuffles balls, and then at some point some ball is going to come out, and then they read a number. 
So this I would call something which is not arithmetical but uh, governed, say, by a physical process because basically uh, the belief is that in this device basically all possibilities are eventually go going to come up. Of course, the most obvious uh, form of an, uh, an, uh, a physical device to generate uh, pseudo-randomness would be coin flipping, whatever that means, because depending on, on what, your, uh, what your coin is, the way your coin is, is biased, and it's always one or another way, or the way you're going to toss it, this is going to uh, affect its, uh, its random or pseudo-random properties. So in any case, what is kind of interesting is that uh, there are two studies. On one hand, you have studies which are in the tier of dynamical systems, for instance, where you try to understand certain randomness or pseudo-randomness through deterministic uh, systems. And these models are very non-trivial to analyze. On the other hand, you kind of have uh, what you may call the dynamics in arithmetics, which are similar models which are now arithmetic, works with model arithmetic, and fortunately there one can analyze them much better because what you have behind you are very powerful tools like uh, various inequalities and things like that, which you wouldn't have for the, the real physical devices. So there is some kind of parallel of true chaos in physics, which is some kind of arithmetic uh, chaos. I mean, these are the obvious things I can tell you about the parallel. So in some sense, one can do more at this point, it looks like, in the arithmetic world than proving things rigorously in the physical world. Von Neumann, in fact, uh, I, I looked yest uh, yesterday at his paper and he was putting forward as a typical example to create, this is a statement maybe some of you understand but I did not, uh, as a typical way of generating uh, physical randomness was uh, to look at, um, uh, at um, nuclear catastrophes in some sense. So he was putting this forward as an example of, of, a, ran of, a, of a random process, but I mean, maybe there is some uh, theory behind it just to uh, explain why that uh, could be indeed a, a form of pseudo-randomness, but there was no explanation for it, so I'm just citing one of his, uh, of his thoughts there, which is not a very practical way to do it, of course. Yeah, well, I can answer you on, uh, on that. Uh, the example of the x squared pseudo-random number generator uh, is certainly not good to generate uh, random numbers in Monte Carlo methods. And there are other techniques, at least experimentally proven, to do much better, which are, for instance, Mersenne twisters. What the x squared pseudo-random number generator is good for is unpredictability. On the other hand, if you go to, say, cheap computers with uh, limited computational capability, then the type of uh, generators like considered by Bloom Bloom Shop. So this was the X square uh, 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 generator. There is another one, which is what they call the congruential uh, generator, where you multiply with a number. Uh, they have the advantage that they produce something random using, say, they, they require much less memory. So if you go to many devices, say video games or so, the kind of pseudo-random number generators which are present there are of, the, of, of this simple type. They perform less well, and this is not for serious calculation, but they can be implemented with a very limited software. But at least experimentally, they are much better devices now. I'm not sure you were expecting that kind of answer, but it, it is not a lie. Well, this is a, an issue is how you break the code. Now, what we were discussing here makes an assumption, of course, that uh, uh, factoring an, an integer is hard. Now, whether this is really true or not is another matter, but if it is not, then of course that, that whole thing falls apart. Any other questions, comments? If not, I'd like to...